So premature contractions and pre-excitation is another uh, subset of our arrhythmias that I've laid out for you. And really what we're pretty much going to focus on are premature ventricular contractions. So what a premature ventricular contraction is, so go back to think about what normal is first. So normal is you get SA node conducts down through your atria, causes atrial depolarization, which causes your P wave, uh, and then you get your AV stimulation, and then that causes ventricular depolarization as it moves down the bundle branches, and uh, that causes your QRS wave, and then your ventricles repolarize, and that causes your T wave. Now, when you have a PVC, what happens is you get kind of a little twitch in your ventricle where you're having normal sinus rhythm, everything's going along fine, but then all of a sudden you get this little fiber that decides that it's going to fire and it causes a, an entire contraction of the ventricle. Now you might think this sounds like something else, and it does. This sounds like VTAC. Now what PVCs and VTAC have in common is that there's some little point in the ventricle that's causing the ventricle to contract. So it's not the SA node, it's not in, in between the SA node and the AV node, so it's not a supraventricular tachycardia, and it's not the AV node, as it should be. So it's, it's in the ventricle. So that's what it has in common with VTAC. What it has separate from VTAC is that VTAC is self-stimulating and it happens over and over and over and over and over again. So you're getting constant ventricular contraction, uh, constant ventricular stimulation. PVCs are just little isolated events. They may be frequent, but they're isolated events. They're not repetitive. So you'll get, you'll get QRS, uh, you'll get P waves and QRS waves and normal sinus rhythm in between the PVCs. And that's what sets it apart from VTAC. But what is in common with VTAC is that there's some little uh, rogue fiber that's causing ventricular stimulation in the ventricle. So these can be seen in perfectly normal patients and it can be seen frequently in post-MI patients. And uh, whether it's a problem just depends, like any arrhythmia, depends on the patient's symptomatic and hemodynamic state. If the PVCs occur often enough and frequently enough that it, it can actually result in hypotension, but that's pretty rare, um, what you will usually see is a patient having PVCs uh, as a result of digoxin toxicity. That's relatively common. So... Um, anytime you have a patient with frequent PVCs, you should look for uh, any kind of laboratory anomalies, any kind of electrolyte anomalies, look into the patient's me medications, maybe even consult pharmacology, because a lot of drugs can cause PVCs. Uh, symptomatically, the patients will describe PVCs as a palpitation, but it won't be like VTAC where you're having palpitation, 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 sustained, you just get this all of a sudden point where you feel, oh, I just felt my heart jump, and then you're fine. That's characteristic of PVCs because it's just an isolated event. So this is what a PVC looks like. You're trotting along through normal sinus rhythm, and then all of a sudden you have this weird looking QRS wave some kind of contraction going on here, some kind of electrical activity. And it is indeed a ventricular contraction, but it's not a normal one because it's caused from within the ventricle. And then after that, you just go right on to your normal sinus rhythm. This can be normal and fine in a patient, and we don't need to treat this. But if we see them frequently, now this patient, it's happening more, then we may need to look in to something that might be causing this. We don't necessarily need to treat premature ventricular contraction itself, we would want to treat the underlying cause as to why this is happening. So here's another one. And what we do is we define premature ventricular contractions when they happen uh, as how often they happen. So for instance, if a patient has 
frequent pre, uh, premature ventricular contractions. They have regular PVCs. What we do is we look at how often the PVCs are happening. So, okay, here's a QRS, 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 and then the fourth one is a PVC. So this is called quadrigemini, Q-U-A-D-R-I-G-E-M-I-N-Y, quadrigemini. And what that means is every four beats is a PVC. This one here is also quadrigemini, four normal QRSs, and the, or three normal QRSs, and each fourth one is a PVC. Here is bigemini, normal PVC, or normal QRS, PVC, normal QRS, PVC. So you could see that this might be a problem because you're getting these abnormal uh, premature ventricular contractions. This is more severe. Bigemini is more severe than trigemini, which is more severe than quadrigemini, which is more severe than uh, just random PVCs. This is uh, this would be trigemini here. So you're seeing every third is a PVC. So you can also see multifocal PVCs. So here you've got PVCs occurring in different kinds of shapes. So unlike this one here, where they all look the same, all the PVCs look the same, here they are appearing in different shapes. And so what, that's, what that means is that you've got different parts of the ventricle causing PVCs. You've got multi Focal, so what that means is multiple places. Focal means place. Multiple places causing PVCs. So you're getting different kinds, different places causing the PVCs, which cause these different, uh, these different uh, appearances. So the treatment is going to be individualized. So if the patient is simply just having occasional PVCs, or if they're even having regular, somewhat regular PVCs, we're going to observe them. If they're having occasional PVCs and they're hooked up to an EKG and they're just occasional once in a while, you know, maybe you see two of them in a day, don't worry about it. Don't need to do anything. If they're having trigemini, uh, then you might want to go in and look into that. But you don't necessarily need to treat them if they're not having symptoms. Now, if the patient is post-MI, but they're hemodynamically stable, you're going to administer IV beta blocker. And really, this is totally unnecessary because any post-MI patient, you're going to be giving them IV beta blockers anyway. So IV beta blockers are something you start right away as soon as they come off the ED wards. So um, patients who are post-MI who have PVCs are managed with IV beta blockers. The IV beta blockers should help. You may increase the dosage of IV beta blockers, I suppose, if they're having PVCs. Okay, now if the patient is having PVC, so let's say they're having bigemini and they're hemodynamically unstable, what do we give them? We give them the same thing we give for VTAC, and that just kind of delineates how this kind of has some similarities to VTAC. We give them IV amiodarone. Okay, and then the other thing here that is kind of a uh, pre-excitation uh, is the re-entrant uh, tachycardia, and that's uh, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, which we talk about in the tachyarrhythmia. And that's simply where we have a re-entrant fiber that connects the ventricle uh, conduction system to the atrial conduction system. And so we get this, uh, this tachycardia with this delta wave here. And that's right here. I talk about this at length in the tachyarrhythmia section. So if you want to hear about that, refer there.